Inhibitors in hemophilia are polyclonal IgG4 antibodies, which neutralize the effect of the replacement product or replacement protein, and therefore we are unable to use the replacement factor concentrate any longer for treatment of bleeding in these patients. The causative mutation uh, that results in the hemophilia is the major driver for development of inhibitors. The larger the deletion, the higher the likelihood of uh, developing inhibitors in patients. Other genetic risk factors include race, ethnicity, polymorphisms that, uh, that are involved in other immunoregulatory genes, as well as the MHC complex, have been identified as other genetic risk factors for development of inhibitors. Non-genetic risk factors include the timing of replacement, especially if it is done in the setting of a highly immunomodulatory time, such as uh, a major bleed or surgery. Um, in addition to that, the type of product has been questioned as a potential risk factor for inhibitor development. Intensity of treatment at first or any exposure are potential non-genetic risk factors that lead to inhibitor development. Prophylaxis has been extensively discussed as a potential uh, modulator of inhibitor development and might potentially prevent the development of inhibitors. Development of inhibitors is the most challenging complications in patients with hemophilia, and personally I find that those patients to be the most challenging. Once patients develop inhibitors, the bleeding severity increases exponentially to the point where many patients um, become wheelchair-bound and are unable to um, function on a day-to-day -day basis. Even daily activities result in significant bleeding in these patients, which makes it extremely difficult and a painful process for them. Once a patient develops an inhibitor, our first um, response is to try to eradicate the inhibitor. Eradication of inhibitors involves ITI, or immune tolerance therapy, which is essentially replacing high doses of uh, recombinant or plasma derived protein on a daily basis, in addition to administering bypassing agents to um, treat any breakthrough bleeding or prevent any bleeding during this period. ITI is both challenging as well as expensive. Challenging because in a child, this would mean daily venous access, and sometimes this would require the placement of a central venous catheter in order to facilitate uh, the access of a, vein, of a vein on a daily basis. Large doses of factor concentrate have, been, have to be used in order to try to overcome this inhibitor that has been formed in the patient. And uh, this is obviously where the expense comes into play. These patients also experience a significantly increased frequency of bleeding as well as severity of bleeding, and this requires the replacement uh, or treatment with bypassing agents on a regular basis and often multiple times a day. So this is an extremely challenging period of uh, treatment in these patient populations. As of this time point, I think we still, as hematologists, consider the eradication of the inhibitor to be necessary in our patients, even with the arrival of new treatment options for these patients, which may uh, decrease the morbidity and mortality associated with inhibitor development. At this time, we still feel that it would be necessary to eradicate the inhibitor in order to optimally manage the care for these patients. ITI refers to uh, an attempt to try to eradicate the inhibitor, and this process involves replacement daily high uh, doses of factor concentrate. But the treatment of bleeding still involves the replacement, uh, still involves treatment with bypassing agents, which are activated PCCs or recombinant factor seven. And uh, these products are typically administered on a daily basis in patients who have significant bleeding associated with inhibitor formation. So this helps to somewhat mitigate the daily episodes of bleeding that these patients can experience. However, despite this, many patients will have breakthrough bleeding, which means that we would have to administer bypassing agents more frequently than just once a day. The half-life of APCCs is about eight to 12 hours. And so depending on the severity of the bleed, if it's a major bleed, I might need to administer APCCs every eight hours. If it's not so, I may be able to give one dose and get away with it. For recombinant factor 7A, the frequency of dosing can be as frequent as every two hours. And sometimes we may be able to do this two or three times a day and manage minor bleeds.